Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Living Room, where we listen, learn, and live together. I'm your host, Richard Martin, and we have been on a roll, inspiring, uplifting stories that have come from north, south, east, west, various arenas. We've kind of cast a wide net thus far in our journey together, and the lessons, the principles that we've added to our lives have been game-changing. Today promises to be no different. Our special guest is one who has an eye for the artistic. He is a brother who has a hand for all things design, and he uses his passion to invest in the development of people, their brands, their initiatives, their organizations. I've known him for years now. I can't believe I can say that. We have known each other for years, going to Pine Forge Academy and Oakwood University together. He's a brother living in Georgia. I won't tell you exactly where he is in Georgia. I have to let him tell you if he wants to tell you. But as we listen and learn from our special guests, I believe that you will be inspired. And who knows, you might be even led to connect with him for your own personal goals. Please welcome to the living room, my friend and brother, Mr. David Anderson. What's going on, man? Hey, man. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. It's good to see you. Yes, sir. Good to hear your voice. Yes, sir. Good to see uh, see your face and hear your voice as well. Go back a long, long time. Definitely. For yeah. sure, for sure. It seems like just yesterday we were hooping at Pine right. Academy. With him. <laughs> you a little better than me, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Don't sleep, man. David got out there with all confidence and let people know, listen, I can shoot. I got hops. Don't let the height <laughs> deceive you. I know my brother's taller than me, but I can yeah. get up there. Yeah, sure I have enough. to be, what, 5'11", 6 feet. My brother, what, 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, so exactly. I, I, I can get blessed in the height department, but, you know, I have that confidence. So That's right. <laughs> That's right. And I can truly say that as long as we've known one another, David has not backed down from a challenge. He's always uh, presented himself with a level of confidence. And uh, I think that that's very important as young men and as young black men in the world in which we live that, um, you know, they often say there's a fine line between arrogance and conceit and confidence. And I think sometimes in an effort to shy away from the first two, people can lose the third one. But I think having confidence in any endeavor is very necessary. And so as we have developed a friendship over the years, I've definitely seen that. How's life for you now, man? What's been going on? And life has never been better. Um, Literally, I've been working, doing graphic design, branding, art. But most of all, I've just been taking it day by day. You know, quarantine has really slowed things down for me. And working from home, uh, I've kind of already been in quarantine for the last few years, but it has allowed everybody else to slow down as well. So everything's been picking up. I've been getting ahead of schedule and really just maximizing my downtime and at my free time, really. Um, You know, during quarantine, I found out that I have a lot more time than I thought I did before which is um, amazing because now I'm able to, you know, put certain projects on the forefront. I'm able to do certain things, spend more time going to visit my family, going to talk to friends and everything like that. So I feel like it's a blessing in disguise and I've really been doing well lately. I would agree with that. In fact, I was having another conversation recently and a buddy of mine was saying the same thing that whereas we all can recognize the very obvious and real drawbacks of this season and yeah. no way, form or fashion, do we take lightly the grief that many are experiencing as a loss of at the loss of loved ones or just even at the illness of others. <clears throat> others have lost jobs. So so that's true. But to be honest, there's also been with the challenge and with the obstacles some very real opportunities. And I think you hit it right on the head, this time piece. I mean, even just this platform, uh, the living room and other initiatives that I'm sure listeners would agree with. I was able to spend quality time with family. I was able to mend relationships. We were able to complete home projects, you know, just do things that we didn't think we had time to do. And so with this imposed pause, as it were, has come, yes, some very real uphill challenges, but I think when we look back on it, at the end of the day, the record will show there were some opportunities, some discoveries made during this season. So I'm glad to know that it has not come as a as a a storm, as it were, on your parade, but it's really um, watered the ground, allowing some wonderful fruit uh, to emerge with what you're doing. So you mentioned, man, that um, it's provided time for you to work and uh, we kind of see your space, man. I'm envious, man. I I, I see the brick, (laughs) man. You got the art going. So let me let's ask you this. When did you discover uh, that you had an eye for art and design? Um, well, 
it it starts all at the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't remember when I discovered it or around which age, but I do remember that my earliest memories are with a pencil. Wow. Right? Um, so I there's this painting that my father did of two lions, and I probably was one one and a half, two years old, and I drew a car on the back of it, a little ugly little car, and I'm two years old. But it started there, mm-hmm. right? Because my father, also a pastor um, in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, he is an artist as well. Grew up painting, drawing, being a creative director before he became a pastor, um, and so automatically. I look up to my father, right? I look up to him. I want to do everything he's done. That's why I was a theology major at school. But, you know, the artist side was really what reigned supreme at home because you would go home and see all these majestic paintings, all of these amazing things that your own father did. So I wanted to automatically just do that. So uh, at a young age, I picked up a pencil and I never put it down never put it down. So two, three years old, um, I've always been creating because I had a family full of creatives, um, you know, a background, and but also being where I was around the Oakwood community, a lot of creativity, a lot of music, definitely. And art and everything around there. So it just helped me, you know, cultivate this environment that allowed me to be free in and of myself. But at the same time, there were a lot of um, tension that was bringing me back from being an artist, you know, the whole art isn't a real career type thing. Mm. But I discovered it as a, at an early age and I decided that this is what I was put here for or this is what I was made for. And I, I, God literally showed me like at an early age, this is what you do best. Wow. This is what you do best. And I never took it for granted because when I was at school, when I was at preschool, although it was stick figures, they were advanced stick figures, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) Um, And the kids would always run up to me and ask me, hey, can you draw me a picture? Hey, can you do this for me? And automatically, I I truly believe that everybody finds their purpose or or, or they're introduced to their purpose at a young age, right? It may be a situation you've been through or a culture that you've grown up in. Many different reasons. But I really feel like the majority of people are introduced to their calling at a young age when you're pure minded. Right. Mm. Because we grow up, we get programmed, we get all of these ideas in our head about what society is. Right. But when you're young, especially when I'm looking at my niece, my nephews, when I taught art middle, middle school and elementary school. I would see specifically the youngest ones, the preschool, the kindergartners, their creativity was endless. Right. Right. So when I gave them a blank sheet of paper and a few crayons, they would come up with anything. And that's when I really started to notice, wow, you I really have to stay true to that guy, that kid that was sitting at that table, drawing, coloring and everything. I have to keep a promise to him that I'm going to to. Uh, carry out your dreams and 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 your aspirations because the me now is programmed. I have a lot of trauma. I have a lot of different things going going in me. So when can I go back to the the most pure place wow. that I've ever been? And so that's where it all started at a young age. I do not remember being the type of person to say I want to get involved in art. No, it was just put on me. I think that that places a premium on how we view children. Mm-hmm. It is often assumed or taken for granted that it's not until they become teenagers and sometimes when they're about to pivot and go yeah. into the workforce or go into the military or go into college that then discoveries will be made. But I think that many people can relate to having initial uh, aspirations or even just feelings if you didn't have language to put to it. Like yeah. you said, these were advanced stick figures as far back as I can remember. I had a pencil in my hand. I didn't have an economy of words to articulate at two, three, four years old, you know, here's what I, here's what I know or what I believe. It's looking back, I'm able to shape it in words. I can relate to that. People will often ask me, <clears throat> when did you know you were supposed to be a pastor? Well, that clarity did come within my teen years, but I can say that growing up four, five, six, seven years old, that I did have a, an enjoyable experience in the church context. Yeah. Um, my parents did not make it burdensome or strict. Now they they definitely had standards and boundaries that we had to observe, but 
I didn't have a suffocating religious experience, which I think was very foundational to what would ultimately become clear for me that a part of my calling, a part of my reason for it being was to be able to serve as pastor and a spiritual guide and leader. Um, but then even before the professional aspect of it, just being able to be nurtured in an environment that made a relationship with God, yeah. you know, something to be wanted and something to be desired, which again, is easy to take for granted. So as a pastor now, just as you said, <clears throat> when I see children that I pastor, I, I'm very keen to the possibilities that a young girl or a young boy could be looking at me and seeing in my present their potential future. Absolutely. And, I, and I'm very hesitant to stifle that. I, I listen, for instance, there's a young little girl, I think she's six in, in my congregation. And man, this young girl, when she prays, you know, these aren't Fisher Price prayers. Yeah. You yeah. know, they aren't, you know, just <laughs> prayers that that you rehearse, no shade, no knock to the children. I was one of those children who had rehearsed prayers, you know, memorized from your parents. Mm -hmm. But when she prays, she prays with a certain level of insight mm -hmm. for that age that makes you say, hmm, yeah. you know, what is God showing us as a community now yeah. that we ought not be surprised in 10 years and 20 years when she's 16 and 26 and beyond and we see what God is doing through her. It calls us to pray for her very sincerely now that God will protect her and keep her. So man, what you're saying, I can roll with and, and I think it makes a lot of sense that at a young age, this is what I, this is what I can recall. So you would say then, or would you say, let me not, let me not lead you, mm -hmm. that your family, did they seek to help continue to nurture this artistic expression or did you feel in any way confined or suppressed at all? The, the beautiful thing about my family is that I come from a family who is of course a Christian family. Sure. But at the same time, they, they understand that life is not dictated with within the four walls of the church. Mm -hmm. So they know that the work has to go outside of the church as well. Um, and that way I didn't have my father pressuring me to go down the ministry route because okay. my father, my grandfather, and one of my great grandfathers were all pastors, right? Mm -hmm. So it runs in the bloodline. But with my father being um, an artist as well and my mother doing what she did um, in human resources, but just being a loving woman, um, and all of my siblings as well, we understood that we all had a different mission, mm. right? And it might be the same in career-wise, like we might be creatives or industry within writing films or doing art, whatever it may be, but we all had our own purpose. And never did I feel pressured to go down a route to become a doctor, to become a lawyer, to become a pastor. They always said, do what you want to do. Now, mm -hmm. of course, they put the pressure behind me to get an education, to pursue things that will make me money. You get what I'm saying? Sure. To live a decent lifestyle. Um, however, at the same time, they, were, they, they said that they want me to be happy more than anything. And you said something back when you were talking about your family, how you were raised, how your parents made your environment a non-suffocating environment. Sure. That is really important, right? Because whenever I was drawing or locked in, matter of fact, I like to, to use this example. My parents let me and my older brother draw on the walls. Serious? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so in our room, right? It wasn't in any other room. Nothing. You can't do that in the living room. Don't do it in the kitchen. But in your room, we had literally a wall full with drawings. You couldn't even see the white on mm. the wall. We actually had to paint the walls blue uh, after we were done because we filled the walls up. And, you know, with giving us this, this free environment within our little space, they said, sure. this is your room, right? Keep it clean, put your toys up, but you can create it the way you want to create it. This allowed us to be within our creativity and not just do it. Sure. Right? So I would put it on the wall and I would see it sitting there in front of me. Right. And so now when I leave and I come back, I'm reminded, yo, you're an artist. It's right there. 
You get what I'm saying? When I'm waking up or when I'm going to sleep and I'm looking at my wall, and I got a little cartoon on the wall. I'm just sitting there and my mind is just going because my parents are like, do it. Listen, we can paint the wall. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? We can sure. scrub it off. That is not. Now, don't do it out there where the guests can see. But if they come, if your friends come back here, they can see what you did. And that allowed me, along with many other things, to have an environment of freedom, yeah. right? Of absolute freedom within my artistic expression. And this allowed me to create a foundation at a young age of being able to express myself and know how to express myself. Because that's a thing that a lot of people have trouble with, is they want to express themselves, but they don't know how to. Right. And if you give a child at a young age an outlet to say, hey, this is how I feel, even if it's creatively, artistically, spiritually, whatever it may be, you give them that outlet and they will express it and you will be mind blown at the results. You know, uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about the 10,000 hour rule. Mm -hmm. um, he, he critiques it to some degree, but he also kind of confirms it that for those who are masters in a craft or trade or skill set, that somewhere in their formative experience, um, 10,000 hours of practice of rehearsal were acquired. Sometimes these hours were informal um, practice or rehearsal. Other times they were in informal. And that came to mind as you were sharing that story. And the image was powerful that your parents, they, they gave you both uh, order, but then they also gave you uh, freedom to say, listen, here are what here are our expectations. We expect you to clean your room, do your chores, do your homework, but we also, to some degree, expect you to express yourself. And here is the freedom to do it. Yeah. Now, what I'm thinking about is, and and I've been afforded the opportunity, like I like we said at the beginning, you and I went to school together, went mm -hmm. to school together with your older brother, have relationship with your older brother, know your parents, right? So, so as you're as you're mentioning these stories, I can see them all in my mind. <laughs> that also gave you all an opportunity to get your hours up. Yeah. When you think about it, those 10,000 hours that have come for you weren't just in uh, formal art classes, but they were also in the confines and the safety and the comfort of your own home, given range to roam and to discover. And you said something that was profound to me. We don't just want you to do creative things. We want you to be creative. Yes. And yes. during these past several months, I have found a growing connection between doing and being. Mm -hmm. Now, we live in an, an environment that really places a high premium on doing. Right. But I think that there is something to be said about the the existence, the being component. Um, let's talk about that a little more, because if you ask 13 people, what does it mean to be a creative? You might get 13 different definitions and that's fine. But for you. What is an, what is a creative? We know what it is to do creative things, but if you had to articulate, even if only for yourself, when you say, or when somebody says, here is a creative, what do they mean? What do you mean by that? I specifically mean, when you ask me the question of what is a creative, a human. Mm. Like, I'm not going to put too much on it. Sure. It's a human, because my thing is, every single time I ask this question, I go to, one verse in the Bible, and it's not even the full verse, it's just the beginning part of it. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the world knows it. It's Genesis 1 1. Yes, sir. In the beginning, God created. We oh, can wow. stop right there. We can stop right there, right? Because if we are made in the image of God, mm. we are supposed to emulate what He do does. The first thing He did was He created. Now, we like a, a lot of people, if you're a mathematician, if you're a doctor, somewhere where you're not in the arts, you, you probably don't think that you're creative. Mm. When people like Ben Carson, bless his heart, had to create a way to separate those twins. Yeah. Right. Uh, um, different people, Barack Obama had to create certain programs to 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 give people opportunity. A creative is a human that is connected to their purpose. Whoa, whoa, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that is it. That is it. A creative Ooh. is a human that is connected to their purpose because if you're connected to your purpose, you're connected to the creator. Yes, sir. So you are what? A creative. Because mm -hmm. you are the result of what he is doing through you. And so, like, I feel like a lot of people don't want to give themselves you know, a pat on the back for what they do 
or they don't want to say, hey, I'm creative because you might have a singer. Like at Oakwood, it was it was one thing that you knew that the singers reign supreme. Right. The singers, music reign supreme. So when you go there, it's so intimidating because you have all of these people who can play these beautiful instruments, who can sing the Aeolians and all of these different things. And so people put creativity onto them. But then I'm I'm asking you, what opportunity are you going to create for somebody else? What platform are you going to create for somebody else? What are you creating within your life that is going to help other people? Because yes, I can create a painting, I can create a, a logo, but I cannot create systems. I cannot create computer systems. I cannot create opportunity for people, right? And so a creative is a human that is connected to their purpose because God gives you ideas. He will download and drop ideas from the sky and put them in your head of new ways to do what you're doing, new ways to express yourself in whatever area it is. So a creative is simply a human that is connected to God. Listen, write it down, <laughs> tweet it, do what you have to do. You can even pause right now and just rewind and listen to that again. A creative is a human connected to their purpose. That is golden, bro. Yeah. And the, the thought that came to my mind, because for me, it broke the mold of what can often be a very um, skill specific definition of creative. And you touched on some of them. People can normally limit it or often I should say limit it to, you know, photography, videography, paint, musicality, um, vi whatever it is. But as you begin to help us envision other forms of creation by rooting it from the very beginning, I think that that is very important. Um, I remember growing up that there was a, a young brother in, in my class. This was, I was in second grade, he was in third grade. Mm -hmm. And I was coloring a picture. If my memory serves me correctly, it was a picture of a house. Okay. You know, the teacher had done some photocopies from a coloring book and handed it out to all the students. And we were to color, 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 color. He came to me, he said, why are you coloring outside of the lines? Mm. No one had ever told me anything about coloring inside the lines versus outside the lines. When a piece of paper with the image was put on there, we had crayons and you went to town. Yeah. And yeah. for the first time in second grade, I was presented with this convention mm -hmm. that when you color, you always color within the lines. And for a long time, that's what I did. I sought to color as, as good as possible inside the lines. And, and I think there's a place for that. Don't get me wrong. But what happened was whenever there was an opportunity, now I'm speaking beyond now the actual page of drawing, to, to color outside the lines, to break convention, to think outside the box. I had years and years of nurturing to say, no, stay within the lines, stay within the lines. Let me tell you what helped me kind of challenge that was my father, when he would pull me out of bed Sunday mornings to cut the yard down in Florida. Most of the lawns had either horizontal or vertical lines in them. Hmm. Right. When they were cutting, okay. most people went left to right or north and south. And I'll never forget one day my dad said, we're going to cut diagonal lines. Mm. Said, well, I've never seen anybody cut diagonal lines in the lawn yeah. before. Mm -hmm. He was like, well, just because you haven't seen anybody do it or just because this isn't the norm yep. doesn't mean there is there's there are no grass cutting police. No one's going to come around here. This is our yard. Yep. Right. We can cut it in the way we can cut circles if we wanted to. Right. <laughs> we can write our family name if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. And it totally helped kind of release this tension that wherever lines are put, that's where they have to stay. Mm -hmm. That however it's been done, that's how it should always be done. So I just appreciate again, your definition of a creative. A creative is a human being connected to purpose. If God has given us so many different kinds of purposes, then we're bound to see lines that aren't just horizontal or vertical. We're yeah. bound to see people coloring outside of the lines of convention, not just to be rebellious, yeah. but because it's connected to the creative expression of purpose that God has given me. And I'm grateful that your family had yeah. the opportunity to give you space and room at an yeah. early age to breathe, because I think it brings you to a point now uh, as a young adult where you are establishing your own and helping others yeah. that you're not answering those questions because you had the chance to wrestle with them earlier. I want to ask you something else about coming from a family of creatives and entrepreneurs. Um, are there any other lessons or best practices that you learned 
that have kind of laid this foundation for you as you're building your brand. You mentioned your father is a creative. Yeah. And um, I know that your family, you all have established businesses, right? Mm-hmm. That have not only impacted, again, those inside the church, but outside of it. What have you taken? What have you grafted into your own space that has helped lay the foundation for you? Great question. Um, so like when I was younger, um, my father decided probably around four, three or four years old, we were living in New Jersey. Uh, he decided uh, to pursue ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, we moved down to Huntsville, Alabama. He started going to Oakwood um, and, and pursued his ministry. But at the same time, he was uh, had a t-shirt company that he ran from out of the garage. Wow. So we had this big machine. We couldn't even park the cars inside the garage. We had this huge machine that he got, um, he I probably built it, I don't know what it was, but it's a huge machine that uh, did the t-shirts. It was it used to heat t-shirts up and, and put the screen printing down on the t-shirts. And he would be up with my oldest brother, Jeremy, um, probably till two, three, four in the morning, hmm. getting t-shirts out for Oakwood graduation, getting t-shirts out for AM and and different companies and different concerts and everything like that. And I would go down there and of course see my father behind the computer on Photoshop creating these t-shirts and then printing them out and putting them through this. And then we have a whole box of t-shirts right there from our house. And that laid down a specific foundation for me of, of not just working for yourself, but working with your family. Wow. Right? Like, like he was really instrumental. Him and my mother were really instrumental in being a team, two CEOs, two COOs and, and of, of any business that they came up with, mm-hmm. right? Because they wanted to get their family, they wanted to get through college, get their education and give their family a better life than they grew up with. And that automatically was in, in, injected in all of me and my siblings. Sure. We all took on that that spirit. So now my brother is a motivational speaker, business owner, my sister is in education, my other brothers in film and I am in art. Um, and it, it, we all have taken everything that they laid down for us, but specifically I'm the youngest. And so I take also things from my three older siblings. <laughs> <laughs> With my, my oldest brother, I take his grind mentality, his, his get up and go get it every day. My brother literally has the highest, he's 10 years older than me. He has the highest level of energy that I've ever seen in my life. Wow. Like, I don't even have as much energy as he does on a daily basis because he, he just, it, it just comes from inside of him and he's just getting everybody up. And as the leader, the oldest of the siblings, we look at him and we're like, yo, <laughs> that's, that's who you are. And that's what I take from you with my sister is grit. It's mm-hmm. grit. My sister has been through a lot, especially as a black woman in today's society. And she has never given up. She just never gives up. And I'm like, listen, if you can go through as much as you've gone through and not give up, it would be an insult for me to carry the same last name as you and give up. Like, it would just be an insult because you have put a blueprint in front of me to say, hey, no matter what's thrown your way, keep on pushing forward. And with my other brother, Daryl, um, you and him were in the same class. Uh, he, he just has taught me to go for your dreams, to go for your dreams unapologetically, which is beautiful because, you know, when he graduated, he went all the way out to LA and pursued film and is still out there now. And, you know, I looked at that, I'm like, man, you really went to the other side of the country, right? <laughs> because I'm the type who's always like, my family lives here in Georgia. I'm always, I always want to be around family and people that I know. Um, but with him, he was like, listen, new environment, new people. I don't know anybody here, but I want to put myself out there. And so specifically with my whole family, they've taught me, you know, the grind mentality, grit, going for your dreams, but also working with your family mm-hmm. and creating your own platform where you can be able to express yourself, get your finances right or whatever it may be. But most importantly, you can just do what you're meant to do in the way you see fit, right? I don't have to ask anybody for anything anymore. It's beautiful because now I, I, I finally have gotten to a point when I was nine years old, I said, I will work for myself. 
I was waking up early for school one day and I said, yo, this is too early. Like, this is too early, even though I wake up early now, right? I'm up at six, five now. But when I was younger, I was like, listen, I want to work for myself. Mm -hmm. And I really stayed true to myself over the years of really uh, being uh, adamant about working for myself. And now I'm there. But I, I also see that when you work for yourself, you're really not working for yourself. <laughs> you're really working for everybody around you wow. because now you have to be your own boss. Now you have to be your own, have, uh, uh, be responsible for your own schedule and for everything. And for me, you know, that foundation was laid by my family. So I love it. For those who uh, caught it, you caught it. But for those who didn't, let me let me rewind. The, the preacher in him came out because he <laughs> gave us the, the three points. He said, uh, grind. <laughs> Grind, grit, and and go. Yes, and <laughs> the three. I, I'm ready to make an appeal now. Oh yeah. man! <laughs> but real talk, grind, grit, and go. Those are wonderful principles, and you're right. That lays a nice three layer foundation for you to have confidence and faith, and just this spirit of optimism. Because everyone knows when you are pursuing anything of value and worth there's going to be challenges. This has not been a smooth ride for you. As you are seeking to build your own, often you are the only one laying down bricks. But man, when you have family around you, even just one other family member or one other friend who believes in you, and to have your experience where you have just this interpersonal belief, you believe in your sister, your brothers, your parents, they believe in you, you all believe in one another. And that belief is not just lip service, but it is actually expressed in, in sweat equity. You know, I'm sure you can pick up the phone and hear it's a sibling or your parent on the other end saying, hey, Dave, we need you to help us with this or vice versa. You can call and say, hey, I'm in a bind or I have an idea and I know that you have this level of expertise. Yeah. Forget the ideas. Let's just go to the emotional space. Yo, I'm feeling like giving up. But you call your sister and she's like, bruh, <laughs> let me pour into you right now. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I've seen Jeremy at work. You are right. His energy is infectious and contagious. Man, yep. Daryl from young, from teenage <laughs> in high school, he was speaking things that I don't think we, as his peers, really had a chance at that moment to grasp. He talked about producing movies. Yeah. We didn't even have our degrees yet. And he was running around with the camera, literally. <laughs> yep. I don't even know if I should say this, but I think he'll laugh when he hears it. You know, your boy Daryl would sleep in Moran so that he could continue to code and, and <laughs> render, I should say, and edit. Yeah. I'll never forget that movie premiere mm -hmm. in a movie theater. He said, guys, I'm going to rent out a movie theater so yep. that I can premiere my movie. And we were like, Daryl, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> Only Spielberg does stuff like this. And sure yeah. enough, we walked right up in there mm -hmm. and yep. <laughs> premiered his movie. And uh, we had a chance to connect as a class, some of us brothers from the 07 class, yep. um, a few weeks ago now. And he was on there and we were asking him different questions. And so it's good to see mm -hmm. what can emerge, what can be born um, out of a family supporting itself. Yep. That's awesome. Outside of your family, do you have any other creative inspirations? Mm, wow, that's a great question. Any other creative? Well, you know, for me, um, I really look at, I don't, I don't like to only look at artists, right? Sure. Uh, Michelangelo, Kahinde Wiley, Jeff Koons, different guys like that um, are very in, in, inspirational to me from art wise, but I don't know them, right? Mm -hmm. So um, for the people within my circle that I specifically know, um, growing up, first, it comes from the pastors that I grew up around. Uh, they were I, I, sitting down in church every week. I always I wouldn't listen to the songs usually like I wouldn't listen to the children's story even. But when I saw a, a man of God get up in front and start speaking with authority, I always listened because even my father at home would always talk about, you know, listening, being attentive, you know, uh, um, and, and giving your undivided attention. Um, and so when I, I would see that, that would give me a lot of inspiration because I would see how these gentlemen would take these words that were written down thousands of years ago and paint a mental picture mm. to you. And it's like, whoa, how do you do that? How do you literally take me from my environment that I'm sitting in, bring me back in time and make it clear for me? You get what I'm saying? So those were, those were the first uh, people 
the first group of people, because I remember sitting in E.E. Cleveland's classes Mm -hmm. when I was a young kid and my dad was going through there and just listening to that stuff. I'm like, yo, y'all are dope. (laughs) Y'all are real dope. How y'all doing this? Um, Who who else? Who else? For me, uh, I've been working with a gentleman uh, uh, by the name of Alexander John. He's a a, a fashion designer. Um, But people, music, like literally, I get inspiration from kids. Right. Wow. Like if I see a kid drawing, I'm like, yo, I remember how dope that was. It's so easy for me to get inspiration now um, because I find that when you get to that 10,000 hour place, um, you actually don't need inspiration to do what you do. Right? I remember um, one of the professors, Jesse Williams, uh, Jesse Wilson, um, Pastor Jesse Wilson. He told me uh, at school, he was like, um, if, if by now, when you get my age, if you can't just go up in front and just preach a word, then you have not put in your hours. Wow. Right? Because you should be able to have so much in you that it just comes out whenever. And, and for me, I took that. I'm like, wow. And at the time, you know, I was still, I've been an artist my whole life, but I wasn't as good or I wasn't as convinced of it being a career as I am now. Mm-hmm. So I, it, it wasn't automatic to me. I still had to get inspiration to draw something, inspiration. And after college, when I asked God, I said, God, what do you want me to do? What, like, I get it, mm. I, I could go into pastoral ministry and I could do this, but is that specific avenue meant for me as a person? And God said, no, I'm using that, what you learn and everything, and I want you to apply it to your art. Mm. So now when you use your art and everything like that, you're, you're, you're taking it more seriously. You're putting in the hours. And so as I put in the hours, it started to become super easy to me. And I'm like, okay, so I don't need loud music in the background. I don't need, you know, to see somebody else painting or to get inspired anymore. It's just a skill now. It's become, it, it, it's come from a gift to a, a talent to a skill. Now, a skill like Kobe Bryant, you can do it lights out anytime. I can wake up in the middle of the night and draw now. Right. I can like literally give me a pencil, give me a marker, give me a pen. I can do whatever you want, whenever you want, because I put in the hours. Now that's a scary place to get to. Okay, It's a very scary place to get to because I feel like a lot of men, when we, we, we hone into whatever we do, if it's speaking, music or art, it, once you get so good at it, you can get arrogant with it. Mm-hmm. You can get really arrogant with it and, and you can misuse what God has put inside of you. And for me, you know, never get being arrogant or cocky or putting my stuff out there where I'm like, I'm better than or I do this and you don't. Like for me, whenever I see another artist online clowning another creative or or something like that, I will DM you and tell you to stop. Like I will, because I know how it is of being the little kid in the class that is not as good as everybody. Me, because I struggled academically growing up, right? I was in special ed in the second grade, wow. literally with children in wheelchairs and children that were, that were um, dealing with, with special uh, um, issues and everything like that. It's because I did not learn the way everybody else learned around me. I was more so of a person who learned through colors, who learned through touching stuff and doing things. I wasn't an auditory learner where you can just speak to me and it comes in and I'm just processing it. No, I have to touch it. Mm-hmm. And so automatically, you know, um, this through, through life, I, I went through struggles in school all the way to college to the point where I had to find out that I used to have dyslexia. I grew up with dyslexia, did not even know it. Wow. He didn't even know it, bro. And, and it was crazy because the whole time I'm like, yo. And I knew it one night because I was doing homework and I read a full sentence backwards by accident. I'm like, okay, this is, this is like, what, what's going on here? Sure. And, and I was like, okay, so words. And now it's, it's crazy because I'm a reader now. Like, I love reading now. Um, but before, you know, it was just a, a, a big, big thing. But to go back to your question, um, I draw inspiration from anywhere. Okay. Literally, it can be the smallest thing. 
I love music. I love people. So if I if I if somebody opens the door for me on the way inside, I'm like, let's go. <laughs> I'm like, let's go. They this person was nice to me today. So I'm inspired to do something great because for me, um, you know, it, it used to take super big things, big events, um, and, and and things to inspire me, but now I find it anywhere. So even cleaning up and keeping my area clean, that's sure. inspiration for me. So every day, every morning and every night before I go to sleep, I clean out my brushes, I set everything up um, um, so I can keep that inspiration going. Sure. Is there a location anywhere in this world that you would love to be able to go and set up shop and paint or draw? Now, not necessarily relocating permanently, but if you could, you know, somebody gave you a ticket, say, hey, here's a blank check kind of ticket, wherever you want to go. Would you go to wow. Paris? Would you go to Greece? Would you go somewhere in Asia? And you could spend three or four weeks just looking out over a body of water or looking up at mountains or down into a valley or over some green meadow. Is there a location in the world where you would love to go and just be able to hang out and be free artistically for a space of time? Ooh, oh, wow. Um, you know, it's funny because I've never actually thought of that question, but unknowingly I probably have. So. <laughs> I'm going to say it's not on this earth. It's okay. Actually, like I would love to be in a spaceship mm. covering the outskirts. Yeah, I'm with that. Um, because at a young age, I really loved space. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it 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 was it really stemmed from a biblical standpoint, right? God coming from Orion's belt when he comes back or the way that he created the sun, moon and stars. And so I automatically like attribute out of space with the totality of God, mm. right? Like he's omnipresent. So this is a part of him. Like he's here. Yeah. And for me, when I'm looking at like I, at a young age, I used to always go outside and look at the stars. I used to go outside, just count them, try to, you know, form the constellations and everything like that. And I feel like, you know, everywhere on earth, yeah, like I could go there, draw a tree, go there, draw water and everything like that. But to have the perspective of being so far out and in the middle of just this big thing, like when I'm at the beach, that's the closest I get to outer space, right? Mm -hmm. So when I see the endless water, like that's so therapeutic to me because when you're on land, you see the end of everything. But when you go to the beach, you see something that's endless, or at least from your perspective, it's endless. And it just reminds me of who God is. And so if I go out of space, it's like, this is really like his, this is his, his palette. This is what he creates on. <laughs> like, <Ooh. this> is <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so for me, like that, that's really, I would love to go out there because that way I can have the perspective of looking back to where we were created and where we're from. And seeing how small and minute we are, because we're not that important. <laughs> so for me to go anywhere on Earth that's either man-made or an attraction that man has put, I'm like, listen, put me up there closer to God. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's real. Yeah, that's real. So you come alongside people mm -hmm. and you help them create meaningful, memorable, and oftentimes marketable products, whether it's book covers, business cards, logos you know, or an entire brand kit, really. Um, the seven brand is your company. Yep. So help us understand what it takes to go from design or brief, design brief to final concept. Now we see the kind of catchy, creative, compelling, clean product, mm -hmm. but I would imagine that that takes interaction with clients, back and forth, getting a sense of what it is that they're going for. Yeah. Now, you've seen, I'm sure, and I don't know if it bothers you or if you just understand this comes this comes with it, but you've seen, I'm sure, you know, the age old clip art, you know, somebody just did something real quick. But for somebody like yourself who, who does this from a not only gifted, talented, but as you've mentioned, skilled, there's been training with this, what goes into the process from beginning toward the end product. If I came to you and said, hey, Dave, listen, I'm wanting to have a brand kit for this. What's the process like? Okay. Walk us through it. 
So, so the process goes in, um, I usually do it in seven different steps, um, but I'll, I'll kind of con um, concise it for, for time. Uh, so the process is first an interview, right? Uh, a, a, a conversation between me and the person to, for me to see what their vision is first, right? Um, I wanna see where you are, what you have, what you're dealing with, where you want to go. I want to hear the whole nine. I want you to talk to me so I can see if it's a good fit, if I can actually offer, you know, what you're looking for or if I can refer you to somebody that you're looking for, right? Um, this way, you know, you create a relationship with the people that you're working with and not just a business one, but one where you're actually finding out what's important to them besides their business in their real life. And um, for me, I take that and then, if we feel that it's a right fit, um, I send them a design brief, right? There's a bunch of questions just asking about your business, asking about your brand that a lot of people don't, don't ask themselves when they're building something, right? A lot of people, when you're building something, you'll only worry about the logo, but you won't really worry about, you know, your audience. You won't, won't really worry about the color palette that you're using or the fonts or where you're putting the logo and everything like that. So for me, um, I give them this design brief so it can challenge them um, in looking into what they're trying to do. And it stretches them because after the design brief, they feel like, yo, listen, I never asked myself these questions before, but thank you for asking me these because now I know that my brand is really important. After that, I take their design brief and I take what we had in the conversation and I go to my stick sketch pad. I start just sketching out little logos, mm. just sketching out different things like that, um, doodling around because for me, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I have to use everything you said because I have people who who have barbecue sauce companies and um, people who are ministers and then speakers and then somebody who's dealing with whatever it may be. Like I have so many different clients that I have to go into your world. I have to put on your shoes and exist like you, you would exist for a while mentally so that I can be able to tap into what you want as an image, right? So after the design brief, after I draw it up, then I digitize, digitalize it, um, put it in the computer and present it to them. We go through uh, you know, a process of them showing me what they want changed, different colors. And then I, I set them up with a brand package that will really help them launch their brand. Things like a brand manual. Brand manuals are really important for people because if you don't have a brand manual and you're running a brand that's actively online, when you have somebody else designing for you, they might not know what font or what colors to use or what placement to use your logo. And so it's important to have that brand manual. Set them up with apparel, their logos, business cards, letterheads, different things like that, website, so that I can give them a basis, um, a base brand to go off of. Now, the important things, thing about a brand is a brand is not just an image. Okay. It's not just a logo, right? Everybody, when they see Nike, they, some people might think, okay, they're famous because of their logo. No, when you see Nike, you see LeBron James, you see Serena Williams, you see all of these different athletes, you see a type of lifestyle to live. So when you see somebody walking in a Nike hoodie or some Nike sweats, you're like, they probably just got done working out. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> when you see a Starbucks uh, um, logo, or I like to use this example. If you, if, if I was here, right. And I had a coffee and I had a McDonald's cup coffee, it would be your, your reaction would be very different. If I had a Starbucks coffee, let me yeah. explain. Right. Because McDonald's coffee is actually the number one rated coffee in America. Hmm. People would think it's Starbucks, but McDonald's coffee is number one. Why? Because most people are in a rush. Whoa. Most people aren't prepared. Most people have to go to the drive through to get the McDonald's coffee because they can get it quick and it's easy. With the Starbucks coffee, when you see that emblem on it, you see a culture of people who are planning out their day, people who are sitting down in the coffee shop with a MacBook, typing a book, they're more prepared, they're more professional. That is what branding is. Branding is a feeling that comes with 
the image. It is the, the, the culture that you create. That's why when you see certain logos, you get a certain feeling in yourself. And that's what I try to tap into for people is I want to tap into the culture of what you're creating and not just the image. Yo, that's profound. Yeah. In fact, one of my questions was going to be, what is a brand? And you spoke to it. And that was a perfect example because I can definitely relate to the feelings that each of those emblems and images elicit. The Ooh. names alone, when you think McDonald's, you think rush, fast, quick, <laughs> fast <food. and> economic, <laughs> right? That that cup of coffee that I can get, you know, boom, speeding through the drive through it may cost me a dollar and fifty, dollar fifty. But Starbucks, it's going to cost me a little more. Mm -hmm. But I actually, when I walk into a Starbucks, I appreciate the atmosphere. Yep. You, you, I don't think I've ever been in a Starbucks or seen anybody lining up in a Starbucks and felt like either the employees were rushing or the customers felt like they needed to rush. Exactly. exactly. People are very calm, waiting for their meals to be presented, waiting for their frap, their cap, their cup of coffee to be presented to them. Excellent example. Um, one of the most powerful demonstrations of your art and artistry that I've ever seen live uh, took place while we were at Oakwood. Yeah. And uh, I had never seen this before. Um, and so for me, the origin of it was always my guy, Dave. You got to see my guy, Dave, do this. Yeah. Now, since then, and, and this is just my bias, since then, I've seen a whole bunch of other people do what you did and what you've done. And that was you were painting while someone else was singing. When was the first time you ever did that? And what was the, like, when did you discover I can do this? So it, it was, I believe at the end of sophomore year in college, me and a friend um, decided to, you know, do something super creative, right? And I was never the type who likes to brag about me being an artist because my father, was an is an artist and he he at a point was so much better than me that I didn't even want to tell people that I'm an artist until I got close to his skill level you know what I'm mm. saying um and so for me I was just like listen I I want to I want to give because I used to write skits at Oakwood I used to do a lot of stuff during the AY but it never would be me and be me behind the scenes and I say I want I want to be able to put myself out there where I'm doing something for God. Like, and I'm not a singer at the point, at the time I, I was scared of public speaking. Like you could not get me to speak in front of two people. Um, and, and so we came up with an idea and I was like, let me paint a picture of Jesus on stage. I never did it before, never mm -hmm. did it before or anything like that. Went up there and I was not scared. Like, I've been doing drawing for so long that I remember the first time I've ever preached. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> I remember the first time I played basketball at a home game in high school. You get what I'm saying? But yeah. when I went up there with a canvas and a pencil or a, a paintbrush, I'm like, yo, this is, this is who I am. So that's, that was the first thing that stood out to me. Wow. Because I was not scared at all. Because me, right, I remember Aaron Rodgers just said, and, um, and, and I'm going to say this because it's not a cocky statement, but Aaron Rodgers said that my worst season is some guy's best season. Mm. Aaron Rodgers said that. Why did he say that? He can't just say that. He couldn't say that in college. He couldn't say that in high school. He had to say that after he put a resume behind him that backs that up. Sure. Right? So for me, at the time, I knew that I put in so much work in art my whole life that even if I draw something ugly up here, it's going to look nice to the majority of people. Sure. <laughs> they have not even drawn, like they can't draw. So right. in my mind, I was like, listen, you can come up here, you can be scared and mess up and then everybody's gonna be like, oh, he can't draw. Or you can come up here and be as confident as possible, do what you've been doing since you were two and just draw it and see the result. And for me, I was just like, you know what? That's it because I, in class, I would always you know, make fun of people by drawing them on the chalkboard or the uh, marker board and everything like that. We draw people little pictures and everything. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, I know I can draw fast, right? I know I can do it within a song or two. 
Um, I know I can do that, but what am I going to do? How, how, what if, and so Jesus, of course, like, yo, the face of Jesus. Um, and, and while I was doing it, man, you know, while you're up there, it's a blank canvas and you don't sure. even know like what you're going to do. Like, you know, that I'm, it's somehow, some way Jesus is going to be put here. But as soon as I put it on there, that's when all of those hours that I put in automatically came into play. Right. Like, so when I was drawing eyes and everything like that and moving the sheet of paper around and doing this, that, and the third, it was like, oh, okay, just do this now. And that goes to a testament of you cannot do what you don't practice. You cannot do what you don't practice. Point blank, period. If you're not practicing it every day of your life or at least every week of your life, why would you expect to go in front of a crowd or in front of a pe- in front of people and, and give them something that you're not even true to yourself? Mm. Right. So many times I see people get up there, get up in front of people, no matter what they're doing and try to front like like they've been prepared for this. And, you know, the crowd will know when you're not prepared, you will get those reactions and those results. But when you are prepared, like one thing I like about you, I, I, since I've met you, you have a keen sense for preparation. I remember we were in the gym at a basketball game, <laughs> Oakwood University, and you're sitting there with your laptop. <laughs> you're sitting there with them. I'm like, yo, everybody in here is an all black game or something like that. Everybody in here worried about what we're going to do after and everything like this. And you are sitting there on the bleachers typing, everybody walking by like, what you doing? You're like, oh, I have some stuff. But it was like, yo, when we saw you preach the next time, oh, (laughs) that's what he was doing. That's what, and and that's that's my thing is, I love seeing the process of creation Mm -hmm. and people take their crap seriously. Because a lot of people don't take their craft seriously. So you can't really do it um, when the time actually comes. Like even with LeBron James or Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant, when the time came to either make the right play or take the shot, they were prepared for it. So for me, I just want to be prepared at all times. And doing that first painting, um, I felt prepared. I sure. felt prepared. And I, I started doing it more after that. And eventually I started preaching while I did it. And this actually woke up the art, the the sleeping giant that was inside of me, right? Mm. Because during college, I did not want people to know that I was an artist because I wasn't as good as I thought I could be, or I just didn't want to be in the limelight. Um, But for me now, it's kind of like, listen, God has given me this gift. I'm not going to hide my light under no bushes or under nothing. I got to shine it. I got to shine it for everybody. You know, people can often romanticize spontaneity, Mm -hmm. the idea of just getting up out of bed, going and running a marathon, getting up out of bed and drawing a picture, getting up out of bed, going to offer a speech. And I think what is often untold, you just spoke to it, that what might appear to be spontaneous. So every now and then, say, for instance, on ESPN or SportsCenter's Instagram page, there'll be some random video footage of let's say Michael Jordan at some resort and I mean he's just killing the game right you know 50 plus year old Michael Jordan still dropping buckets still backing people down into the paint having his way and it would appear to be very spontaneous he's on vacation couple guys want to play work up a sweat they got a chance to do it with MJ but everybody knows that spontaneity has behind it years and years and years of preparation absolutely right Another example will be Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods can roll up on any golf course this side of heaven, right? And tee off, give you 350, 400 yards, right? Spontaneously, right? Just, hey, toss him a club, go for it, okay? Not me. And very recently, I was at a golf tournament and it was clear that I am not Tiger Woods, right? I can't just do what he does because I have not practiced how he has practiced, right? And even as I begin to practice, my objective is not to become Tiger Woods. I want to become the best best Richard Martin at golf that I can be. So you can't do what you don't practice. And watch this. Go ahead. Go ahead. Actually have no choice but to get good at what you're doing. Mm. Let me explain. Those who are lazy on a daily basis will become great at being lazy. Hmm. 
the human condition is that God made us to do whatever we do, whatever we decide to do at the highest level we can possibly do it. There's no other choice. So God has given us the freedom of choice, though. So yes, sir. Now we can decide what to do. Now, if you're investing your time and taking naps, watching Netflix, going on uh, eating food and just just being lazy. Guess what? God has created you to be amazing at whatever you do. So God's like, if you want to do that, you'll be really good at that. For me, noticing that and noticing whatever I'm putting my hands on, whether it's good, whether it's bad, no matter what it is, I'm going to become really good at it. Mm. If people don't notice that. And if people don't know that, what's going to happen is you're going to find yourself becoming real good at things and you're going to wonder why. OK, why am I not good at this? You're not good at that because you're great at that. <laughs> yeah. And that's why. And so you have to stop doing that. Whatever it is, I'm not going to put out a list of things that you have to stop doing. But whatever you want to get good at, start doing. And mm. you won't be good at it for a while. But you will get good at it because that's the way God created us, whatever. So if, if, if I decided to go into carpentry and building stuff, I would become a really good one over time. That time that we use to, 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 to cultivate and to build skills is one that we're always using. Sure. You're, you're using it from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, no matter what you're doing, what you're looking at what you're listening to, who you're involved with, the places you're going, all of those things, you're going to get better at doing whatever you're doing if you continue to do it on a daily basis. The seven in the seven brand, is that speaking to the seven step process or is there more meaning to that? So there, there's, there's a lot more meaning to that. Growing up Seventh Day Adventist, the number seven for me has always been um, a sacred number. Okay. A sacred number. And um, it means whole. It means complete, mm -hmm. right? So when I say the seven brand, I mean the complete brand. Okay. Not just, you know, the seven process or anything like that, but the a way of saying that your brand is complete in a seven step um, period. But the, the word, even when I moved into my studio about a, a month and a half ago, how I knew it was my studio was I saw the seven right here just on the wall. That was there. That this was there. I did not <laughs> <put it> there. <laughs> and usually if I see something on the wall, I'm going to be like, mm, let's scrub that. But I saw that. I walked into here. I was like, oh, OK, this is it. Okay. That's that's what it is, because for me, um, just the seven brand just means holistic, complete um, brand. So I see you've got a couple of art pieces behind you. Sir, yes, sir. Choose one of them or all of them, man. Where are they coming from? Are these commissioned? Are these just personal? What so are we looking at right here? Are per, uh, pieces of a body of work that I'm building. Um, I have a passion for the human body, um, the human condition, especially Black people. Mm -hmm. um, within today's society, I feel like art is coming back with a full renaissance. And we're entering into or within a renaissance right now where everybody is creatively at their peak um, and it's acceptable for self-expression and everything like that. Uh, growing up, my favorite artists were Raphael, Michelangelo, Da Vinci, um, guys like that. Um, and they all are Caucasian white men, right? Great artists, but their art you know, show their culture, sure. they show their perspective. And for me, um, when you see all these majestic paintings and you see all of these images with, with people who don't look like you, um, it does something to you subconsciously and it says, okay, black art isn't as great as this culture's art mm -hmm. or anything like that. Um, and so the great thing about my father is, of course, my father's older than me, Right. And he went through a period of time in a culture where he loved black art. Right. He was a black artist, rubbed shoulders with a lot of black artists. And so he all that was in our house was black art. Mm -hmm. Right. So from an artistic standpoint, I knew who the greatest artists of all time were. But in my home, we had Thomas Blackshear. Thomas Blackshear is is. 
uh, famous for a lot of the different um, images that we probably would see on a bulletin at church or anything like mm-hmm. that with a black Jesus or anything. Um, because he he does he takes you know images of black people and, and puts them on canvas. I would see my dad painting, and so for me, I had this great duality of of seeing the real art world, but also being engulfed in the black art world. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, okay, after college, I'll, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What's your best at? I said, okay, so that's art. So if you want me to do this, now how do you want me to do it, right? Because mm-hmm. I, got, I got to keep asking you questions because you can't get me this far. I'd be like, all right, I got it from here. No, how do you want me to do this? And he's like, okay, so remember that theology department that you went through and everything. Remember all those different classes and all those different verses that you use? Put that on the palette. Mm. Yeah. All right, I'll put that on the palette. All right, so you're a black male in America. You were born in the hood with your family, but your father got you out of there. But most of your family and friends are still existing within that that society. And um, so put that on your palate. OK, mm. um, you 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 understand the Bible and you were born naked and Adam and Eve were created naked. So put that on the palate, put all of these different life experience on your palate and use it. I'm like, how, God? Like, how you just gonna tell me to put all this on the palette and use it? And what it does is it takes years of just sketching on the pad and constant conversation with yourself, constant conversation with God of where am I going with this? Mm. Because being an artist is scary because there is no blueprint. There is no blueprint. Being a doctor, you go to this school, you go to that school, you get this uh, uh, type of grades, you get that job. Being an artist, It's not that easy. And so for me, eventually I started to, you know, draw this halo around people, right? Mm -hmm. Around the black people. And I'm like, okay, I like that right there because it's a circle. That means full circle, but there's also a halo standing behind them. And I want black people to be seen as holy. Mm -hmm. The word holy in my mind kept ringing, holy, holy, holy. I'm like, that's it to show black people as holy, no matter where or what we are doing at that moment. Mercy, mercy. One thing that I, I really take seriously in my art, and this is the reason why I, I'm, I'm taking so long and building this body of work, is because I understand that the simple image of black people have, throughout the uh, history of mankind, have been used against us. Mm. For me, I want to display Black people as holy individuals. And so I start out, I'm starting out this body of work with Black people without any clothes on, just in, just naked. Mm-hmm. In front of us, it's called Naked Saints because of the fact that I, we come into this world naked. And that's how my art is going to come into this world, naked. Mm-hmm. I want you to see us for what we are because I do not want you to pervert these images, These are holy images. These are holy bodies. We see the black body, male or female, killed on screen probably once a month, twice a month. We have a new name, a new hashtag every single time. And it's because people don't value the simple presence Mm. of a black person. Mm. Right? Like we value the presence of other people because we were taught subconsciously that these people are here and we're down here. And this is through, goes through hundreds, thousands of years of institutionalized racism, racism, whatever it may be. But for me, I'm like, okay, if I can use my art, so when you walk up to these, these pieces and you see my saints or you see my angels with black wings, right? So I, I, t- I paint my angels with black wings. And I remember one of my friends asked me, is that a fallen angel? <laughs> no. Mercy. No, I said, no, I said, okay. So in the Bible, it says we will mount upon wings like eagles. Mm. I said, I never seen an eagle with some white wings. That's first of all. (laughs) Second of all, all, the way I want to express the art is black is not evil. Mm. The the color black, when you use that, it's not evil. 
it's just another color. My hair is black. That don't mean like if I'm walking around with white hair and everything like that, that don't mean I'm more holy than other people. My skin is dark. That don't mean I'm, I'm less holy than other people. And so what I wanted to do, and I saw it subconsciously when people see my art, they'll see like these saints sitting down and these saints might have tattoos or might have this, that, and the third. And I'm, I'm asking you, when you're looking at my art, what do you see? Mm. And if the first thing you see is what's on the outside and not the message that I'm trying to portray, that's when we go to the next conversation of what do you think is holy? Mm. That's real, man. Naked Saints. I, I love that we get a, a picture of it right here in this conversation. And it's just a foretaste of what is to come. And I'm excited for its continued development. I want to ask you just a few more questions as we come to a close. It's been said that as creatives, we are often our own worst critics. Mm -hmm. Have you produced your best expression of art yet? Or do you think that is still to come? I don't think... Um... I, 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 no, 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 absolutely not. Um, and do I think it's ever to come? No. I don't think I'll ever do my best painting. I mm. think I'll die before I do my best painting. Mm. The reason why um, is because um, I'm never content. Um, I remember at Pine Forge, I was in a class with Mr. Cherry, rest his soul, uh, Imani Cherry's late father. And um, he, like me, I never liked art class. Like, I'm like, listen, bro, I don't like this. Don't tell me to draw circles because I can draw people. Like, don't, don't do that. And so and during that time, I just really was like just daydreaming a lot. And I would bring him my, my drawings and he would be like, you know, so astounded over them. But then he told me something specifically. He said, never fall in love with your work. I said, what does that mean? He said, never fall in love with your work because your next piece will always be better than your last. Mm. I was like, whoa. Because I used to draw. I used to be so proud of what I drew because I take it seriously. And I went cover it and, and put it away and everything like that. But after he told me that, it took a whole different perspective where I was like, whoa. Like, I'm never going to be as good as I could be. And mm. that drives me every single day to chase this this guy that's always 10 steps in front of me and i'm never going to catch him because if i do that means i've lost all passion mm. right i am perfectly content with growing old and like picasso because picasso died drawing in his bed mm. i'm perfectly content with that story I am perfectly content with that story because for me to know that, because I'm not the only painter on earth. Sure. So for me, I also love to teach art and I want to teach the next great artist. I want to find out who he is. So when I go, you carry that on. It might be my kids. It might not. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But for me, I know that Art chose me. I didn't choose art. Art chose me. <laughs> and with me, with art choosing me, it's like, it's going to carry on its tradition without, with or without me. Wow. You get what I'm saying? So for me, I have so much reverence for this craft that it doesn't concern me whether or not I really do my best piece. And I say, hey, this one's my best piece because I'm always striving for that. Yeah. Right? So as I'm working on a piece, I'm, a, I'm like, yo, this is my best piece to date. But I'm already noticing, I'm critiquing myself as I go. Like, no, you, you did that wrong. We need to work on that over there. You got to work on your, your eyelashes over here and, and make sure those, you got to make sure these proportions over here for the next one. Because I'm always thinking about the next one. I told somebody, I literally have over 500 paintings in my head. Mm. I have about 20, 30 paintings within the studio. But I have over five, six hundred in my head. I don't know if I'll ever get them all out. Yeah, I can relate to that. I, I can relate to that. I've got you know emotional thoughts, messages, books, and right. I'll be writing down stuff and oh, just yeah. like, man, like I need to get there someday. <laughs> sure, sure. Listen, man, I'm I'm already sensing that we need to have a part two because oh, yeah, man. I mean, there's so many other questions that I feel right now. I'm I'm literally holding myself back. Um, <laughs> Because I, I don't want to overdo it in the sense that we 
you've given us some great golden nuggets to really sit with. I'm, I'm still reeling when we talked about you can't do what you don't practice. A creative is a human being connected to their purpose. Yeah. You've drawn from your own personal biography, led us from the beginning to this moment right now, given us a wonderful view, literally, <laughs> into your studio, and we appreciate that. Where can people follow you? How can they uh, connect with you on social media for business purposes, just for support? Other creatives might want to wrap and develop relationship. Where can they follow you? So you can follow me on my branding page is the seven brand dot um, the seven brand on Instagram. Uh, you can go to the the seven brand dot com t h e the number seven brand dot com or the seven same spelling t h e seven b r a n d um, on Instagram. You can also follow me on Instagram uh, under Tavet Lee. Tavet Lee that is my name. My name is David. Lee Anderson, Tibet is just the Hebrew version of David. So mm -hmm. that's basically my name. Tibet Lee is my artist page. So that's where I post most of my paintings and what I'm doing in the studio. The Seven Brand is where I'm posting my graphic design, that business. Awesome. Listen, everybody, I know that you have been inspired as we have listened and learned together from Mr. David Anderson founder of The Seven Brand, a creative of creatives who has dropped bombs of wisdom on us today. I hope that you will be so kind as to share this with family and friends so they too can grow from what they glean and gain from our conversation today. Also, we want to encourage you to subscribe to the channel that you can be in position and prepared to receive other life-changing content that we are seeking to put out on a weekly basis. That's all we have for you on this episode of The Living Room. Until next time, my name is Richard Martin. Our special guest has been Mr. David Anderson. Let's keep listening. Let's continue learning. Let's live together. We'll see you next time.